I was at home and the police officer came to my house. He gave me the news that my son had been injured and I need to get to the hospital. Welcome to Urban Crime Stories. In this episode, we will examine part two of honey trap murder cases you never heard of. Before we continue, please subscribe to the channel and turn on all notifications so that you will not miss any upcoming episodes. The horrifying story of Lyrico Steed. On February 13, 2018, 17-year-old Lyrico Steed's life took a tragic turn when a seemingly innocent meeting arranged through social media ended in violence. Lured to a park in Bullwell, United Kingdom by a girl he had met online, Lyrico was chased and brutally attacked by a gang, sustaining 18 stab wounds. Despite his efforts to seek help, Lyrico succumbed to his injuries five days later, leaving his family and community grappling with the heartbreaking loss of a bright young man full of dreams and potential. Lyrico Steed was born on December 12, 2000 in Bermuda to Kay Shea Steed, from an early age, he was known for his kind-hearted nature and a strong love for his family. Lyrico's world revolved around the warmth of his mother's embrace, the playful laughter of his sisters, and the steady presence of his father. His relationships with his nana and uncle also played a crucial role in shaping his character, instilling in him values of love, respect, and kindness. Lyrico's childhood was filled with moments of joy, adventure, and an unwavering bond with those he held dear, making him a cherished member of his family. When Lyrico turned 14, his mother, Keishe, made a bold and life-changing decision to move their family from Bermuda to the United Kingdom. She was driven by the hope of providing her children with better opportunities and a brighter future. The transition was daunting as they left behind the familiar landscapes of their homeland for the unknown challenges of a new country. However, Kishé's determination and the strong family ties helped ease their adjustment. Lyrico and his siblings navigated the complexities of a different culture while leaning on each other for support, reinforcing their commitment to family as they embraced this new chapter in their lives. As Lyrico approached his 18th birthday in 2018, he was filled with hopes and dreams for his future. He looked forward to celebrating his coming-of-age milestone, eager to embrace the opportunities that adulthood promised. However, the excitement of this transition was overshadowed by an unexpected tragedy that would alter the course of his life and leave a profound impact on his loved ones. On February 13, 2018, Lyrico's life took a tragic and unforeseen turn. The events of that fateful day unfolded in a way that no one could have anticipated shattering the sense of safety and security that had surrounded him. This sudden shift would not only change Lyrico's life, but also ripple through the lives of those who cared for him, igniting questions and heartache in its wake. On that fateful day, Lyrico, at just 17 years old, was lured to a park in Bullwell by a 15-year-old girl he had met through Instagram and Snapchat. With excitement in his heart, he looked forward to their planned date, unaware that it would lead him into a harrowing and dangerous situation. Upon his arrival, the atmosphere shifted dramatically when he was suddenly pursued by a group of assailants. In a desperate attempt to flee, Lyrico ran a staggering 600 meters, his instincts urging him to escape the imminent threat. Tragically, his flight ended when he fell, leaving him vulnerable as his attackers descended upon him, wielding knives in a brutal, frenzied assault. This horrifying incident unfolded shortly before 7.30 p.m. in Stockwell, a time when the park should have offered safety and respite to its visitors. Instead, it became the backdrop for unimaginable violence. In a matter of moments, Lyrico sustained a staggering 18 slash and stab wounds, each inflicted with a viciousness that would haunt the community. Despite the severe injuries he suffered, Lyrico displayed remarkable courage and determination. In a final act of desperation, he managed to crawl to a nearby house, where a compassionate woman found him and immediately called the police and ambulance for assistance. Tragically, Lyrico's fight for survival was met with a devastating conclusion. He succumbed to his injuries five days later in the hospital, leaving his family and friends grappling with profound grief and disbelief. During his time in the hospital, Lyrico summoned the strength to provide crucial information to the police revealing that he had been attacked by four individuals. However, 
the details he was able to share were limited, leaving law enforcement with few leads to pursue. The uncertainty surrounding the circumstances of the attack, its location and the motive behind it, only deepened the anguish of those who loved him. As the investigation into Lyrico Steed's tragic case unfolded, authorities achieved a significant breakthrough when they located a 15-year-old girl who had been with him on the night of the attack. Brought in as a witness, she confirmed that she had met Lyrico through Snapchat and that they had agreed to meet for a date in the park. Detective Chief Inspector Haley Williams underscored the girl's importance to the case, stating, it couldn't have happened without her. She referred to the girl as a honey trap, highlighting the role she played in drawing Lyrico into a perilous situation. Initially, the girl claimed that while she and Lyrico were at the park, they were confronted by four assailants who stole her iPad before chasing Lyrico away. However, as investigators dug deeper, discrepancies in her account began to emerge. The breakthrough came when authorities uncovered crucial CCTV footage, referred to as gold dust, showing Lyrico sprinting from the park with four individuals in pursuit. This evidence was vital in establishing the sequence of events that led to the violent confrontation, shedding light on what transpired that fateful evening. Further complicating the narrative, detectives located additional CCT footage from a bus that the 15-year-old girl boarded after her date with Lyrico. In a shocking revelation, the footage showed her holding the iPad she had previously claimed was stolen, ducking down behind the bus seats as police sirens blared outside. This contradiction raised serious questions about her initial testimony and hinted at her potential involvement in the events that transpired that night, deepening the mystery surrounding the attack on Lyrico. As investigators pieced together the evidence, they reached out to local taxi companies to confirm whether the assailants had fled the scene in a cab. One taxi company confirmed transporting a group of boys about five miles to Snyton. Although no DNA was recovered from the vehicle, the driver retained a cell phone left behind by one of the passengers. Forensic analysis successfully extracted DNA and fingerprints from the cell phone, but they did not match any existing records in the police database, leaving investigators searching for leads to follow. The case took another significant turn when the name of 19-year-old Kasharn Campbell emerged during an online appeal for information. Authorities tracked Campbell's movements on the night of the attack by analyzing cell tower data, discovering that he had been traveling in the same direction as the taxi that transported the attackers away from the crime scene. This connection provided a crucial lead that investigators needed to follow in hopes of piecing together the puzzle surrounding Lyrico's death. As the investigation progressed, police were given the names of two additional suspects, 18-year-old Ramel Miller Campbell and Christian Jameson. More crucial CCTV footage surfaced, capturing Jameson inside a shop, speaking on his phone at 6.42 p.m. This timestamp coincided with a call made from the mobile phone found in the taxi, placing him at the park during the time of the attack. The investigation took a dramatic turn when, while in custody, police discovered a phone hidden in a most unusual location on Jameson. This phone contained not only Google searches related to Lyrico's murder, but also a number linked to the Nokia found in the taxi, intensifying the pressure on the suspects as the investigation continued. Two members of the gang, Kasharn Campbell, 19, and Christian Jameson, 18, were found guilty of Lyrico's murder, bringing a sense of justice to a case that had profoundly impacted the community. The court sentenced both men to mandatory life imprisonment, ensuring they would face significant consequences for their actions. For Lyrico's family and friends, this verdict offered a glimmer of hope and a sense of closure after enduring the pain of losing a beloved son and brother. The outcome underscored the tragic reality of violence that took Lyrico's life too soon, serving as a painful reminder of the love and laughter that would never again fill their home. In a surprising turn of events, Remmel Miller Campbell, 18, along with a 17-year-old boy and the 15-year-old girl, were found not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter following a trial at Nottingham Crown Court. This verdict stirred up complex emotions and sparked debates about the nature of justice in such a tragic case. While they were held accountable for their roles in Lyrico's death, the distinction between murder and manslaughter left the family grappling with mixed feelings. They struggled to understand how the actions of those involved could result in such a devastating loss, 
even if the court recognized varying levels of culpability among the accused. Next, the tragic story of Saima Khan. On May 23, 2016, what appeared to be a devoted family relationship unraveled into a scene of horror. Saima Khan, a 34-year-old mother of four, was brutally murdered in her own home by the last person anyone would suspect, her sister, Sabah Khan. Driven by jealousy and a four-year affair with Saima's husband, Hafiz Rehman, Saba meticulously plotted her sister's death, ending Saima's life in a ruthless attack that shattered their family forever. Saima Khan, who resided in Luton, United Kingdom, was known for her gentle and nurturing personality. She was described by family and friends as a loving, caring, and devoted wife and mother. Saima had a quiet disposition, but was also known to laugh and joke within her close-knit family, who practiced the traditional Islamic values of support and unity. Her family was close, with three generations living together under one roof. Saima's husband, Hafiz Rehman, worked as a taxi driver, while she herself worked as a care worker, balancing her role as a mother with her profession. In addition to Saima, her younger sister, Saba Khan, also lived with them, making family bonds even tighter within the home. However, Saima was unaware that Saba and her husband Hafiz had been involved in a secret affair for nearly four years. Saima had sensed that her sister held a deep admiration for her husband, but had no idea of the extent of their relationship. In truth, Saba had become intensely infatuated with Hafiz, and her admiration had developed into an overwhelming and toxic obsession. Saba struggled to accept that Hafiz was not solely hers and that he continued to fulfill his role as Saima's husband. Saba and Hafiz's secret relationship included several encounters, one of which led to Saba's pregnancy. To prevent their affair from being discovered, Saba underwent an abortion in 2012. The affair continued despite the complexities, and at one point, Hafiz even explored the possibility of marrying both sisters although this was prohibited by their religion. With time, the affair caused rising tensions between the sisters, eroding their previously strong bond. Eventually, Sabah moved out to live separately, yet the emotional turmoil within the family remained. By 2016, Hafiz's attention had begun to shift more prominently toward Saima, which only intensified Sabah's feelings of jealousy and resentment. Feeling betrayed and unable to accept Hafiz's rekindled devotion to his wife, Sabah's bitterness took a darker turn. Her obsession drove her to seek drastic measures, and she began plotting a way to permanently remove Saima from her life. In her fixation, Sabah resorted to researching methods to carry out her plan, exploring ways to commit murder and avoid detection, indicating her chilling intent to act on her obsessions. Sabah Khan's obsession had spiraled into a chilling resolve to eliminate her sister. Determined to carry out her plan, she delved deeply into research on how to commit murder undetected, spending hours combing the internet for advice on evading justice. As her fixation grew, Sabah went so far as to pay 5,000 British pounds to a black magic priest in Pakistan, believing that such an intervention could help her get away with the crime remotely. Confident in her twisted preparation, she purchased a large kitchen knife from Tesco, the very weapon she would soon use to execute her meticulously planned attack on Saima. On May 23, 2016, circumstances fell into place for Saba's scheme. That evening, she was left to babysit Saima's four young children, while the rest of the family, including Hafiz, attended a funeral service at their local mosque. Saba saw this moment as her chance. Late that night, she sent Saima a series of urgent and concerned text messages, telling her that the youngest child was crying and needed her. Believing her sister's message, Saima cut her visit to the mosque short and headed home, unaware of the horror that awaited her. Meanwhile, Saba prepared herself for the attack, donning black clothes and gloves, ready to avoid any trace of evidence. At approximately 11 p.m., CCTV footage captured Saima entering the family home. The footage revealed her switching on the hallway lights as she stepped inside, taking her usual route. Just 45 seconds later, the lights went dark as Saba ambushed her sister. The hallway, which had always been a path to the heart of the family home, became the scene of a brutal assault. 
With the children safely upstairs, oblivious to the unfolding nightmare, Saba launched a premeditated and frenzied attack, overpowering Saima with the knife she had purchased earlier. For the next eight minutes, Saba's assault on her sister was relentless and horrifying. Fueled by years of jealousy and betrayal, she stabbed Saima repeatedly, with a viciousness that went far beyond any simple act of violence. Each stab wound revealed the depth of her hatred and obsession, and Saima suffered severe injuries as a result, with some wounds reportedly so deep they nearly decapitated her. Even after Saima succumbed to the brutal attack, Saba's fury did not abate. She continued stabbing, driven by a twisted sense of possession and rage, as though determined to erase her sister from existence completely. In the gruesome assault, Saba's ferocity and lack of restraint were evident as she inflicted a staggering 68 stab wounds on her sister. Each strike of the knife spoke to her overwhelming jealousy and rage, revealing a dark, relentless determination to end Saima's life. Among these injuries, one particularly devastating blow pierced Saima's neck, severing multiple arteries and her jugular vein, causing catastrophic blood loss. The injury was so severe that it would have been fatal almost immediately. Yet despite this, Saba continued the attack, consumed by an obsession that drove her beyond rationality. As Saba carried out her vicious attack, neighbors were startled by Saima's terrified screams echoing through the night, a sound that would haunt them long after. When the attack was over, Saba hastily worked to cover her tracks, shattering a window to stage the scene as a break-in and hiding the blood-soaked knife along with her black clothing. In a further attempt to support her alibi, Saba made a frantic call to her father and then dialed 911 claiming that an intruder had broken into their home and brutally attacked her sister. Speaking to emergency responders, she portrayed herself as a horrified witness to a home invasion gone tragically wrong. By the time police arrived, Saba continued to act the part, expressing shock and insisting that a robbery had occurred. However, officers quickly began to notice inconsistencies. They questioned her about the blood visible on her arm, to which she replied that she had cut herself on broken glass while trying to assist her sister. The detective's suspicions deepened as they assessed the crime scene. While Saba tried to hold to her story, evidence mounted against her as officers meticulously examined the house. They soon located the discarded murder weapon and her bloodied clothes hidden in her room, casting severe doubt on her story of a botched robbery. With undeniable evidence of her involvement, Saba's facade crumbled and she was taken into custody. Once in custody, Saba's motives and methods came to light, revealing the depths of her deception. Her elaborate setup, a staged break-in, fabricated alibis and attempts to conceal evidence, exposed her intent to escape justice. Detectives soon uncovered her internet searches on getting away with murder, as well as her bizarre payments to a black magic practitioner in Pakistan which she believed would shield her from suspicion. These twisted details painted a chilling portrait of Saba's methodical, calculated approach to her sister's murder. Hafiz, reflecting on the tragic outcome of his affair with Saba, expressed deep regret for his involvement. He admitted that his actions had contributed to the events that shattered his family and led to the loss of Saima. The affair, which began as a hidden relationship, eventually spiraled into jealousy obsession and ultimately murder, leaving him with the weight of responsibility for the devastation it brought upon his family. Hafiz's remorse came too late, with the damage irrevocably done and Saima's life cut short in an act of brutal betrayal by her own sister. In court, Sabah Khan faced the full weight of her actions. The judge sentenced her to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 22 years, meaning she would spend at least two decades behind bars before even being considered for parole. However, this minimum term does not guarantee her release. Saba could serve significantly more time or even the entirety of her life in prison if deemed necessary by the parole board. Her sentence reflected the calculated and merciless nature of her crime, and it underscored the profound violation of trust involved in murdering her own sister. Throughout the trial, Saba's lack of remorse shocked those present. She remained stoic and emotionless, neither acknowledging the horror of her actions nor the grief of her family. Her demeanor provided a chilling insight into her state of mind, a disturbing detachment that offered no apology 
sorrow, or regret for the pain she had caused. The emotionless response contrasted sharply with the anguish of her family, who had lost Saima in such a cruel and unimaginable way. Thank you for watching this episode of Urban Crime Stories. Please let us know your thoughts about these tragic stories in the comments below. Remember to subscribe to the channel and turn on all notifications for upcoming crime stories. Your support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, I will see you with another episode of Urban Crime Stories.